Chapter 12. Francesco sighed. You are more confused than I thought. It's like I told you about this old man and his dream, Dominic tried to explain. Oh, no, Francesco interrupted. We're back to that dream, hey? Well, all right, if you are, as you say, in a dream, why not relax? Soon you'll wake up and everything will be as it always was. So there's really nothing to worry about, is there? Well, Dominic hesitated, I guess. Suddenly, Dominic's worries were interrupted. Ciao, Francesco. Hello. A young girl's voice called from the distance. Dominic and the others turned to see a dark-haired girl in a dirty, raggedy dress running toward them, followed by a small flock of sheep. Ciao, Nina. Francesco called his greeting back to her. I've been looking all over for you, the girl exclaimed as she ran up to them. Her face was flushed and bits of raw wool stuck to her long, dark braids. What's the matter, Nina? Did you miss Francesco? Salvatore teased. Francesco blushed at this remark. It's not me who wants to see you, the girl scoffed. It's Father Tommaso. He's been looking everywhere for you. He says that you're to come at once. She turned to Dominic. She turned to look at Dominic. Who is your friend? She asked with a smile. And why is he dressed so strangely? Il Malocchio is on him, Salvatore whispered dramatically, and that demon he wears on his shirt will put the evil eye on you if you look at it. On hearing this, Nina's smile faded and she took a step backward. Don't listen to Salvatore, Francesco told her. He went on to explain about the earthquake and how confused Dominic was. Nina listened, then she reached into the cloth pouch that hung from her waist and pulled something out. She offered it to Dominic. Mangia, mangia, Nina coaxed. Eat, eat. She unwrapped the grape leaves that covered a large piece of cheese. From my sheep, Nina told him as she nodded to the ewe standing next to her. Dominic took a bite of the cheese. It was the first food he had eaten since the day before, and even though the cheese was sharper and more pungent than the American cheese he was used to eating, Dominic was glad to have something to put into his empty stomach. Antonio was quick to ask for a piece, and Salvatore followed. How is your baby doing? Francesco asked, as a little black and white lamb nuzzled against Nina's leg. Nina's face broke into a smile. She knelt down beside the lamb, and he licked her cheek. My little Galileo, do you see how strong his legs are? He can outrun some of the older ewes already. Dominic could see how proud Nina was of her lamb. He reached out to pet Galileo's soft, woolly back and was suddenly reminded of how much he wanted a pet of his own to be proud of and to take care of. I have to go get my sheep to the pasture, Nina said as she stood up, and don't forget to stop to see Father Tommaso. He said it was urgent. Francesco shook his head. We're on our way there now, he promised, waving goodbye to her. Buongiorno, Nina. Good day, the boys called after her. We will take you with us to see Father Tommaso, Francesco told Dominic. He is the most beloved priest around here. If there is any way to help you, Father Tommaso will find it. He put his arm around Dominic. You can come along with us. What do you say? Okay, Dominic mumbled, pulling away from Francesco. He didn't know if he'd ever get used to all the touching, but he was glad for their company. As he followed behind them, Dominic couldn't take his eyes off the countryside. Having grown up in the city, Dominic was used to city streets, the noise of traffic, doors slamming, people shouting, and the bus fumes lingering around street corners. Here he found himself surrounded by the gentle curves of the green hills, the sound of birds overhead, and the earthy scents of lemon and herbs in the air. Shh, listen, said Salvatore, coming to a sudden stop. Dominic stopped and listened along with the others. He could just make out the faint tinkling of bells in the distance. Donkey bells, Salvatore whispered. That's most likely Dominica, Rendizzi's donkey. We saw them yesterday carrying stones up for the Padrone's new wine house. The orchard is empty. Who is Rendizzi? Dominic asked. He is the giant who works for the Padrone. He is in charge of this hillside, Francesco told him. He is bigger than three men, Salvatore added, and with a heart no bigger than a thumbnail. Anyone caught stealing fruit or hunting on the land must answer to his whip.
Whip? Dominic gulped. He dips it in lie, Antonia whispered, so as to leave his mark for good. Show him the scar, Salvatore. Salvatore turned around and pulled up his shirt. Dominic winced at the sight of the long, thin scar that striped Salvatore's back. Don't worry, Francesco said on seeing Dominic's anxious face. We won't be met meeting Randizzi's whip today. Look for yourself. It's as Salvatore said, the orchard is empty. Dominic followed his gaze to see a small orchard at the end of the path. Three large trees were covered in deep ruby red cherries, and the air held the he heady scent of their fruit. Come on, Francesco called as he and Violetta took off at a trot. Salvatore quickly threw off the heavy net from his shoulder and began to climb on one of the trees. Dominic had never stolen anything before, and the idea of stealing from a giant with a whip made his stomach more than a little queasy. But it was his almost empty stomach that gave him the courage he needed now. He had not eaten anything since breakfast the day before in New York, and the little bit of cheese that Nina had given him hadn't made a dent in his mounting hunger. He watched as Francesco took the birds off his belt and slung them over a low branch of the tree. Dominic knew that, as hungry as he was, he wouldn't be able to eat those little birds. He decided instead to eat as many cherries as he could. He watched Antonio shimmy up the tree behind Salvatore. Together, the two boys threw cherries down, and soon they all sat under the tree, filling their empty bellies with the delicious sweet fruit. Francesco, can we roast the birds now? I'm still hungry, Antonio whined. Shame on you, Antonio, Francesco scolded. You are never satisfied. No, we'll save the birds for our evening meal. Don't worry, Antonio, Salvatore told him. I heard yesterday that Signor Falcone, the, bank, the baker, has a rat problem in his shop again. He'll trade bread and biscotti for every rat we catch. I'm going to try to catch some rats. Maybe I'll be lucky. Dominic remembered the long, hard cookies called biscotti from the Italian bakery in one of his old neighborhoods. He wanted to hear more about the rats and the biscotti, but Antonio had spit a cherry pit so far that it hit a tree a good distance away. I'll bet you can't top that, Antonio bragged. Francesco and Dominic were quick to try, and soon they had a pit-spitting contest, with everyone taking part but Salvatore. Salvatore, how many times must I tell you not to swallow the pits? Francesco scolded. What's wrong with the pits? His brother retorted. At least they fill me up. You're going to end up with one taking root in your stomach, Francesco told him. Salvatore is going to have a tree growing out of his nose. Antonio giggled as he pulled an imaginary tree from Salvatore's nose. Salvatore gave him a gentle shove, and Antonio shoved back, and soon all the boys were wrestling on the ground like frisky puppies. Antonio stopped suddenly when he saw a stub of bread fall out of Salvatore's pocket. "'Where did you get that?' Antonio asked. Salvatore shrugged. "'I found it by the well.' "'And you told no one about it?' Francesco's voice was stern. "'I forgot.' Salvatore said weakly. Give it to me, Francesco ordered. His brother was quick to hand over the bread. How many times must I tell you, Francesco sighed, pulling the bread apart. We are a familia. We are family. And as family, we share all we have. We may not have much, but if we forget each other, then we have nothing. Do you understand? Salvatore's eyes welled with tears, ashamed at having his own greed exposed before the little group. Francesco passed out the pieces of bread, which the boys quickly devoured. Dominic was glad that Francesco had included him. It was only a mouthful, but it satisfi satisfied more than his hunger. It felt wonderful to be included in their family. As Dominic popped another cherry into his mouth, his thoughts drifted back to his own time. He thought about how how poor he often felt with his shabby clothes and old sneakers, but he realized that he never he had never been as poor as these boys. He was never so hungry that he had to kill birds for supper. He never had to steal in order to eat. He never had to trap a rat to get a cookie. 
He never, and he never had to fill his stomach with cherry pits because there was nothing else to fill it. Dominic suddenly realized just how desperate these boys were for food. But at the same time, being with the three raggedly dressed brothers who considered him family made him feel richer than he ever felt before. When they finished eating cherries, Francesco called for a song. Antonio, he ordered, play us something on your concertina. Antonio picked up the little wooden instrument and soon the air was filled with a cheerful melody. Listening to Antonio's gentle tune against the sound of the wind in the trees, Dominic thought of how different the sounds were back at home. The music he liked listening to had only come out of his Walkman or television or a stereo. And the sounds of outdoors were of the cars and buses speeding by, boom boxes blasting on the sidewalks, grinding screeches of the subway, and noisy jet planes crisscrossing through the skies overhead. But here, in this place and time, in the Italy of 1908, there were no such sounds. Here, Dominic listened, listened along with the others to the tinkle of the donkey bells in the distance, the sweet notes from Antonio's concertina, and the rustling of olive leaves in the wind. There was a calmness to this place, a gentleness that seemed so different from the modern city life he had always known. Hey, Tulio! a voice suddenly shouted. Do you smell the armpit of an orphan gypsy?